to Meet Me in the Middle. Lindsay and I are so, so happy to have Elsie Smith with us today. We've been waiting on this interview for how long, Elsie? We've <laughs> been trying to plan this for a while. <laughs> for a while. So, hey, we are going to jump right in because there's so much great stuff um, to share, for him to share with us, and we're just really excited for you guys to get to know Elsie Smith. He is has started an organization called, well, it's affectionately known as Our Fathers Mad, um, which is an, kind of like an acronym for Real Fathers Making a Difference. So this segment, we're gonna kind of go into what all that means. It has to do with mentoring youth, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna pick it apart and pick his brain and, um, we're just gonna make the most of this opportunity today. We're just really excited about it. So um, yeah, I wanna start out with a question first um, and then Lindsay can pick up after that. But um, I wanna know what was the um, seed that was planted in you that said, I wanna help, you know, mentor youth. I mean, tell us about your story and how that made an impact on where you are today with mentoring you. So jump into that one. <laughs> well, a lot of people probably wouldn't believe this, but when I started Real Fathers Making a Difference, it had absolutely nothing to do with kids. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple other interviews out there where I talk about it, but um, yeah, it had nothing to do with kids. I had started to write a book about the importance of fatherhood. I, I realized in my circle of friends and people that I knew and associates, that most people didn't have their father like in their grow up in their lives from birth on up until, you know, either the father wasn't involved at all or the father left out of the picture or either the father came into the picture, you know, later on in life. And it was like a, it was a, a pattern that I found, even when you hear people accept awards and celebrities, you know, you hear speak about the fact that the father not being there, you know, um, and they in spite of that, they still were successful. And to me, I felt like the dads almost was getting a pass about not being responsible fathers. And I felt like that um, that's not fair, you know, because if we hear that mother isn't involved, you know, everyone want to know what's wrong with mother. We hear father not involved, we kind of just passive about it and, you know, going about our day. So I wanted to write a book about the importance because I know that it's important to have both parents, you know, um, and even without, even with my experience of not having a father figure uh, in my life, as far as having my biological father in my life, even if he was in my life, I still know there's value to a father being in your life. So a mother and a father have a, a reason, uh, have a purpose in a child's life. So I started to write a book and I decided that instead of me writing a book, why don't I just go out here and, and do something about it? So I started the organization and the goal was to go out and talk to young men about the importance of fatherhood and to be able to plant seeds to uh, especially let our young men know that a lot of times from us as men, you know, we pat our boys on the back because they have 10 girlfriends, you know, and they grow up thinking that as young men, that their goal is to be able to probably maybe possibly sleep with as many girls as they can, you know, and now you are setting yourself up, to probably be a deadbeat father, to to produce kids that you're not ready for. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to have a different conversation that they usually don't have for men. And that the conversation is, you know, for one, abstinence, why don't we consider that? You know, uh, <laughs> and also just because you're, just because a female um, is willing to have sex with you doesn't mean that you actually have to have sex as well, mm -hmm. you know? So, to kind of change their mindset when it comes to that aspect, because really being irresponsible in that area is one reason why we probably have a lot of kids, a lot of fathers who don't commit, you know, to their kids. So that's kind of what it was about. We, we started a, a intervention program to kind of help fathers get back uh, estranged relationships, kind of connect again. So we had created a program with DHR was included. Counseling was included. Um, but most of those programs didn't take off. We, we tried to start a mentoring program for fathers to mentor younger fathers who may have grew up without fathers, like seasoned fathers like myself. But what happened with the youth program was that someone had called me because someone I know 
she was talking to a coworker, and her son told her that he would probably be doing, he probably would do better if he had a positive male role model. You know, that was his reason for acting bad in school, for not getting good, getting good grades. He probably, he may have been manipulating mom, you know, I don't know. He probably didn't figure that mom was going to actually go out and find somebody for him. So, <laughs> but it just so happened that she was like, I have a friend, you know, and he may be willing to, you know, talk to your son. And they wasn't aware of the organization. So I just basically told her that, well, I have an organization that I started. I don't have a youth program or anything. I can refer you to somebody or I work with him and I just create a one-on-one -on -one program, you know, just working with him and I create a structured program for him. And that's what happened. I started meeting with him a couple of times a month and um, I built, the, that was in 2011 when I started working with him in 2010. And I just built the program around him. And then I brought in another young man and then we got in the Christmas parade. I had a million people reaching out to us after that because that's the first time we were visible. And uh, people wanted to get in the program. So I created a waiting list. And I tried to recruit mentors. I couldn't find people to help me mentor these young men, like to match them one-on-one. -on -one. So I decided to take everybody off the wait list when that next summer came around in 2011. I said, I just work with all these boys myself. And that's where it started. So that's how the youth program actually – started and from that it just the organization just began to transition and transform so god had a whole nother plan for what it is that our father's mad was birth for i thought i was supposed to be doing something else but i think that um uh, this process right here is probably even better because we're sowing into a whole lot of young men now that they can be the ones who help close the gap and begin to set the examples for their peers and for their little cousins and, you know, different people to be able to follow in their steps to make some better decisions when it comes to this, this, this fatherhood, you know? Yeah. How yeah. many, how many, um, how many young people are you mentoring right now? So in our youth program, we average anywhere from 25 to 30 kids in that program. Uh, but we also do a lot of different outreaches. So we have our education program as well. So we work with students K through 12 and that's girls and boys. And we also work um, with foster care, which, which that's where I met you at, uh, Lindsay. We also work with uh, foster care homes and work with youth there. We also have worked with Huntsville City Schools, working with students through mentoring programs. So even outside of what we do with, the, uh, with that particular program that everyone knows about, there's a lot of outreach that we do as far as just going into the community. You know, we may go to the Boys and Girls Club um, and work with them. I know last summer we worked over there with um, – the Seminar Boys and Girls Club. Right. So you talked about, I mean, obviously you're so, I love what, you know, your wording, your title, Real Fathers Making a Difference. I mean, you, I love that from the get-go in this interview, you got right real with it, you know, talking about abstinence and stuff like that. I'm like, that's what I love about you and always have. Um, and uh, for you guys listening, LC and I met, I think, through nonprofit organizations meeting together and collaborating by Fred Whitlow I don't know whatever and um, some of the local stuff here and, and our part our nonprofits um, are partnering together um, but um, okay for that you talk about writing the book too or wanting to write the book but somewhere okay your passion had to start from somewhere deep within so tell us your story um, how you grew up or what, what are things in your life that led you to be so passionate about this? You know, um, I don't know if it was my upcoming that kind of planted those seeds. Um, when life was a little difficult for myself coming because my mother had a, a mental illness. She was a paranoid schizophrenic. So by the time we was in junior high school, uh, we saw it developing. But once she uh, about the time I got to the eighth grade, I think she was like fully into her mental illness mm -hmm. um, with no treatment and no help. Uh, so, uh, and we didn't have a, a father, you know, who was there to be able to intervene. You know, we did have my grandfather and we had aunts and uncles who, you know, did what they could to support us and help us. Uh, but so really we were just in survival mode. You know, I don't need people really understand what we went through as far. And I say we, I mean myself and my younger brother. Uh, so, we just didn't have a, a, I've always been that person who was probably trying to encourage people, you know, in spite of what it is that I was um, going through. So coming up like that, as far as being 
being being responsible for yourself. I mean, you talking about four years of high school where nobody even saw my report card. You know, mm -hmm. um, I had a younger brother. I would go to his school conferences. I mean, I was 14, 15 years old <laughs> going to his conferences, making sure he's doing what it is that he's supposed to do. So, and I'm not even sure. I think that's just who it is that I am. That's who it is. That's that's the kind of character that. Um, that's the person that God just made me. So it was more so natural for me to be in an element of being able to actually go out and support other people and help other people because that's just who it is that I am. I'm not even sure if my circ my circumstances actually could have hindered me probably from living a life to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was so strong in, in the belief of being sure that um, one day that my mom would get better so that means that we got to make sure we at least finish high school. <laughs> you know, there's certain things we want to make sure that, that we are, uh, that we've accomplished and done. So when she come out of this mental illness state, uh, cause she had lost touch with reality pretty much altogether. She don't remember much of the time that she was sick. I was a sophomore in college, uh, when she got better and she don't even remember wow. me really being in high school. She, she couldn't believe I was driving, you know? Wow. So, and it's a lot to the story, and I know we got limited time, so I'm trying not to go too far into it because. Oh, go ahead. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's let's break, and then okay. we're gonna come back into that, and then he can okay. go fully into it. All right, let's go back. We're coming back, y'all. Come, come back. We're gonna hear the rest of the story. Mm -hmm.